Will a gigantic computerized robot eventually run the world's affairs? If so, is there any proof that Earth's four billion inhabitants are headed for such an hour? Learn the facts as we discover why mankind wants, needs, and ultimately receives a computerized number for commercial purposes. The world's current monetary system is creating havoc among bankers. In America alone, the annual check processing cost is $10 million. What a waste. Cash also causes problems as graft, bribery, corruption, and crime sweep the world. Leaders are crying, away with cash and eliminate crime. Attorney Spicer stated in the American Bar magazine, crime would be virtually eliminated if cash became obsolete, for cash is the only real motive for 90% of the robberies. Hence, its liquidation would create miracles in ridding Earth citizens of muggings and holdups. This approach to the problem is spawning experimentation nationally. The Los Angeles Herald Examiner printed the following report. Cashless buying was recently approved for 12 states by the controller of the currency. The Associated Press stated, supermarkets, gasoline stations, and apartment stores in numerous cities are testing the cashless bank account deduction plan for their customers. This is a portion of the electronic funds transfer system which takes care of all one's needs through a number. In connection with a cashless society, plans are being laid internationally to make a numbers system feasible and workable. This explains the strange lines and figures on food containers at the supermarket. The metric system is also being promoted and installed at a cost of billions of dollars by the international bankers. Their aim is a one world government in the 80s. This government will control human beings through computerized numbers. No one knows how each of us spends our cash, but once every transaction is credited to one's number, Big Brother will know everything about everyone through computers. Yes, a new system is on the way, and its equipment is being built at breakneck speed. One such operation is located in St. Louis, Missouri, another in Luxembourg with its major links in Brussels, Belgium, home of the common market nations. Computer World's Nancy French states, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, called SWIFT, has completed its principal hardware and software selection for a communications network that will permit its member banks to transfer funds internationally. SWIFT is establishing a worldwide communications network linking 240 members worldwide. This system is so designed that any, get it, any type of computer system in the world can become a participant. Think of it. Any computer system in the world can be hooked to the mother computer in Luxembourg. Mr. Paul Peterson in his book, Sinister World Computerization, reports that the Luxembourg computer can store the facts and figures on everyone in the world. The building that houses it is over a half block square. The main floor contains all the computerization equipment, and there are five or six floors that are used for the business end of computerization. One of the things that intrigued Mr. Peterson was a microtape about one half an inch wide on a reel two feet in diameter. One reel had the capability of storing 20 pages of documentation on every person living in the United States of America. Think of it. One reel had the potential of containing 20 pages of information on more than 210 million human beings. And there were 7,000 reels on location. What's the speed of such computers? The computer digest states in one half second. Today's computers can debit 2,000 checks to 300 different bank accounts, or can examine 1,000 electric cardiograms, or score 150,000 answers on 3,000 exams, or figure the company payroll for 1,000 employees. Remember, all this is in one half second. An international dictator will use such a computer fashioned after his likeness, Revelation 13, 14, to enslave Earth's teeming millions. He will effectively do this through commerce, the buying and selling of products. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17 state, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number, of his name. This forthcoming computer of the ages will give the Antichrist all the information necessary to govern the world. Its memory bank will know the number, record, and history of every living person. The ID number will definitely include 666 
in one manner or another. Revelation 13, 18 states, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six, or six, six, six. No doubt about it. A definite number within a numerical system is on the way. I believe it will be a prefix such as 666-7, 666-300, etc. Every number on a Visa card must have some differentiation to distinguish one card from another. If all cards were identical, there'd be mass confusion. Similarly, there will be some variance along with the 666 marking. Shocking as it all may seem, such a day is at hand. A cashless, checklist society is being planned for you. Numbers of states are already experimenting. Neighbor, it's later than you think. The reign of a world dictator is upon the horizon. A new Hitler with a monstrous computer to enslave millions may soon overtake the earth. Let's consider now the number 666 and how it could become functional in a mechanized society. Supposing every person were assigned a single credit card number. Do you think this is impossible? An article from the Night News Service, Miami, Florida states, soon many bankers predict that most shoppers will exchange the wallet full of credit cards they now carry for a single all-purpose card and number. Another article by Gerald L. Nelson, Detroit News, says, the American dollar is under attack not from Arab oil sheiks or Japanese car manufacturers or inflation or any of the dollar's usual enemies. The dollar is being threatened by all things. The computer. Why? Well, picture this. It's 1985 and you're checking out at your neighborhood grocery. By then your food bill might come to something like 99.50. That's irritating, but take heart. You may not have to fumble around with checkbooks or cash. Your debit card, please, the cashier will say, and you'll hand her a thin piece of plastic, a credit card lookalike. Then you'll punch in a code number, your own secret number, and presto, you've paid for your groceries. We see then that a world number is feasible in the near future. However, there's a problem. One could be kidnapped or killed for the numbered card. Because of this fact, some are advocating the insertion of a number on one's body. The suggested method propagated thus far has been one that would not mar, scar, or detract from one's features. It would be a laser beam tattoo, invisible to the human eye, but clearly seen under an infrared light. You don't believe such ideas are presently being suggested? Listen carefully, Mr. Skeptic. Senior Scholastic, a news magazine used in American high schools, pictured two young people with members on their foreheads. The photo was captioned, the future. Again, William B. Saxby informs us that the growing economic problem of our expanding society brings difficulties. How do we solve them? Some, he says, have suggested national computerization. But we just can't put a number on people and say, step up and put your head in a computer. Mr. Saxby, how in heaven's name did you ever conceive such a thing? Do you know that you're quoting God's holy word? What seems impossible to you is actually going to occur. Revelation 13, verses 15 to 18 state, the world ruler had power to give life unto the image of the beast, undoubtedly a monstrous computer, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man, no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six, or simply six, six, six. Neighbor, it looks as if it's later than you think. Horrible events are just around the corner, but hope abounds for those who are saved because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon to snatch you away all of his own. First Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 18 describe this blessed event. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Are you ready? The good news is that Christ died for our sins by the shedding of his precious blood, was buried, 
and then rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He did this to save you. Now you must decide to make him your Savior by receiving him as your own. Do it today. And in these last moments, let me encourage you right now to open your heart to Jesus. The time is so short. So much is going on in internationally. Everything points to the fact that our home going is near. The Bible says you've got to be in Christ to go, for it's the dead in Christ and then the living in Christ who are caught up. How can you get into the body of Christ and Christ get into you? By receiving him. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, John 1.12. The message of the gospel is that he shed his blood for you and that he loves you and wants to save you today. All you have to do is receive him. Accept the gift. He'll be ready. Will you do it? Would you pray these words after me? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus died shedding his blood for the remission of my sin. I receive you right now, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. I want to be ready when your call sounds throughout the heavenlies to come up. So come into my heart now. Make me your own child this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to share something with you today that concerns me. And it's the fact that the economic structure of America and the entire international scene may soon crumble. Dr. Saul H. Mendelowitz declares, there is no longer a question of whether there will be a world government for the declaration of interdependence as a part of the continuing drive to dilute, then dissolve the sovereignty of the United States of America for the new world order, a new international economic order. Paul Scott reported the following information in the Washington News Intelligence Syndicate. The one world perpetrators are calling for the development of a global policy on food and oil within the framework of the United Nations. It is their belief that by controlling food, they can control people. And by controlling energy, especially oil, they can control nations and their financial systems. By placing food and oil under world control along with the monetary system, they believe that they can have a world government operating in the 80s. I'm not setting dates. I'm simply quoting world spokesmen who report that these events are actually happening. However, their statements are tremendous in the light of Bible prophecy. Now it's easy to see why the energy crunch ideology has been crammed down the throats of Americans and others in the world. It's a plan to destroy paper money through an inflationary spiral that will make the nation submissive to a new and carefully planned economic system. The American public, however, has never taken the energy crisis as seriously as do the politicians and technocrats of Washington who periodically scold the nation for its ignorance and greed. This public skepticism is encouraged, if not fully confirmed, by optimistic revisions in recent forecasts. There is no doubt in the thinking man's mind that the oil embargo and presently promoted crisis thinking has affected the entire Western world and Eastern bloc of nations as gas, coffee, donuts, and all staples are approximately double the cost they were five years ago. Each additional crisis adds to the vicious cycle of catastrophic events. In fact, we are on the same spiral Germany experienced from 1914 to 1922. It took eight short years for her economic system to fail. Here is a first-hand report of C.M. Ripley, who was on the scene. He said the collapse of German finance changed the nation into an economic madhouse. Gas bills were 30 times as high as rent costs. Prices were unbelievable. A pound of lard cost 20 million marks. A box of matches cost 3 million marks. One raw egg. 12 million marks, and a quart of milk ran 30 million marks on Tuesday and changed to 40 million marks on Wednesday. A bill at the Adlon Hotel for six nights totaled 2 billion 336 million marks. This would have been equal to one half million American dollars. Everything was normal in 1914. Butter sold for one and a half marks per pound. However, by 1918, it had jumped to three marks, a 100% increase in four short years. This has been the exact pattern in America since 1974. 
Then the real problem began. By the spring of 1922, butter had risen to 2,400 marks per pound. By summer, 150,000 marks per pound. And by fall, it had reached the astronomical figure of 6 billion marks per pound, or the equivalent of 1.5 million American dollars. We are on the same dangerous treadmill presently. Supposing the results are the same, this catastrophe would certainly usher in a new world system. Do you think I have exaggerated the situation? U.S. News and World Report plus other economic magazines written by the experts are for the first time in agreement concerning the fact that the dollar could become obsolete. Judge for yourself. Leonard K. Roos, president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, stated in the Journal of Commerce, the American economy may finally be running out of steam. Colonel E.C. Harwood stated that serious inflation could continue for many years or for as long as the people do not realize the government is embezzling their savings through depreciation of the currency. Martin Zweig says, stock prices are perched on a precipice and there's a fair chance of an outright crash. The Memphis, Tennessee newspaper, Commercial Appeal, looked at the future and reported the average worker retiring at age 65 in the year 2050 would draw retirement checks of nearly $259,000, while some individuals would get the maximum of $405,000. Willard Candle, an author of the New World Money System, says, I have been in conversations with men chosen to advise the President of the United States, have weighed their deductions, and examined all their sayings. It is one message. We are moving toward a new system, a number system run by computers. There is not a conversant person in the world with whom I've spoken who would agree that the world is presently beyond the point of no return. No longer is the question, is a new system coming? The question is, when? The question is indeed when. An even greater question is who? Yes, who will be the Antichrist? A world ruler must arise with the new system. This beast is described in Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8. The text states, Power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This despot is controlled by Satan, for verse 2 declares, And the dragon gave him, the Antichrist, his power and his seat and great authority. Who is he? Where is he? I have no doubt that he is alive and on the scene presently, awaiting the moment of his ascendancy to the world throne. Since the international bankers have set the 80s as the time for the implementation of a one-world government, this Antichrist may soon be revealed. When he is, he will set up a world computer system which will keep track of every person on earth, giving each of them a number, 666, according to Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. For he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or simply six, six, six. May I now report some of the mysterious appearances of this number on the world scene? First, the films, the omen and the omen two, and the final conflict concern themselves with a world dictator and the number six, six, six. These movies have been shown from coast to coast in America's theaters and on television, promoting the number. Two, all Arab-operated business vehicles in Jerusalem must have the prefix 666 on their license plates. It's not unusual to see a few hundred per day if one is watching. Three, the IBM equipment in supermarkets displays the number 3X666. Four, inspection tags on Italian shoes contain the number 666. Five, the design of Australia's national bank card incorporates a configuration of the number 666. Six, a newly released introduction to algebra book for children is entitled 666 Jelly Beans. It was written by Malcolm E. Wine and released by the Thomas Kroll Company in New York. 
Seven, the payroll allotment authorization of South Central Bell Telephone Company's Telco Credit Union requires that one fill in his Social Security number after the prefix 666. Scores of additional reports have been received by my office. There are close to 32 of them now. However, the ones I have mentioned are documented, and I possess the evidence that they're true. Oh, what a wonderful day to be alive. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Meanwhile, it's exciting to watch the signs of the times, and especially to see 666 becoming a familiar symbol. I believe the human race is being brainwashed for the future. I also believe that when the Antichrist makes his debut and officially institutes the number 666 internationally, we Christians will be gone. That's right. Paul makes this fact emphatically clear in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 to 8. In verses 3 and 4, he describes this dictator, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Then in verses 6 through 8, Paul informs the saints that this Antichrist cannot, get that, cannot mount his throne until the hinderer or the Holy Spirit is removed. And now ye know what withholds or what holds back the Antichrist coming to power to be revealed in his time. Only he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. After the restrainer's removal, then shall that wicked one be revealed. Antichrist cannot reign until the Holy Spirit's restraining influence is removed. This restraining influence consists of believers in whose hearts the Spirit dwells. So, Christ must come to call his own out of this world before the leader of the one world government assumes power. Current events point to the fact that the international order is at hand, that Antichrist is about to appear, but first of all, Jesus must appear for his own. Are you ready? You say, how can I get ready? Oh, the message of the gospel is so simple. Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He shed his blood at Calvary for you. Week after week, I repeat it because that's the gospel. And the gospel must go forth in its simplicity. Because his blood was shed for you, you can have remission of sins. For without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22. So today you can come and say, Lord Jesus, I see that the signs of the times are everywhere and that you're coming soon. I want to be ready. Would you pray this after me right now? Go ahead, bow that head, pray this. Lord, I am a sinner. I believe Christ died for me. I love Jesus Christ for giving his life's blood for the remission of my sins. And now, Lord Jesus, I receive you. Come into my heart. Save me now. Make me your own. In Jesus' name, amen. I am an American who is proud of his flag and country. This does not mean that I'm unaware of my nation's shortcomings, especially in recent years. The standard of righteousness we espouse so long has been badly eroded, and unless national repentance and revival occurs soon, my beloved homeland may experience a bloodbath. Never have I observed such an avalanche of editorials warning America about nuclear incineration. My hometown newspaper, the Detroit News, mentioned that when the attack begins via the window of vulnerability, 139 million Americans will die immediately. According to the Bible, world war must come, and when it does, America will be part and partial of the international holocaust. Why? because the Bible predicts that all nations will be involved, making it a global tragedy. Isaiah 14, 26 declares, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. In Jeremiah 30, verse 11, God says, I will make a full end of all nations, whether I've scattered the Israel. This would of necessity include America because five million scattered Israelites abide or live in the USA. No nation is exempt including the United States from the universal judgment described in these texts. Again, I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the nations, all of them, such as they have not heard. Micah 5.15 I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. Haggai 2.22 He shall bring forth judgment to the nations. Isaiah 42.1 
The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the nations is on his way. Jeremiah 4, 7. There's no doubt about the matter. America is part and partial of this horrendous catastrophe that will envelop the globe. We, along with other nations, have sinned terribly and must pay the price. The Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14, 34. Again, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, 17. Soon nuclear and neutron blast shall engulf the world as sin is judged. When it happens, the human race will have brought the devastating destruction upon itself, for they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Job 4, 8. Friend, the judgment will strike in a split second, and you too are guilty and will experience the devastating damnation of doomsday. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth. That shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Be ready. Prepare to meet thy God. Amos 4.12. Secondly, America is involved in a Middle East confrontation. Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 describe the entire battle. And the U.S. is discovered in verse 13 under the heading of Tarshish and her young lions. Time does not allow me to prove that this is England and her cubs, including America. So I suggest that you order my album or cassette entitled The Coming War with Russia for complete detail. Presently, let me briefly state that Russia is definitely exposed in Ezekiel 38.2. The terms Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh are all cities located within the present-day Soviet Union. Tubal, the eastern capital of the USSR, is the ancient Tubal in the text. Meshach is Moscow and Rosh is Russia herself. This great bear, Daniel 7, 5, invades Israel from the north, Ezekiel 38, 15. The Soviet Union is directly north of Israel and moves against her in the latter years and latter days, Ezekiel 38, 8. The attack centers around the Holy Land. In fact, one finds the name Israel 17 times in Ezekiel 38 and 39. What nations join Russia in her march against Israel? Ezekiel 38, five states, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with him, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. The nation of Persia is easily identified for Persia changed its name to Iran. Iran, watch that, 1932. The old Persian empire included Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Thus, Ezekiel 38.5 could mean only present-day Iran or all the countries of the former Persian Empire. Ethiopia and Libya, also mentioned, are present-day nations and prominent in current Mideast events. Finally, Gomer is East Germany, and Tagarma is modern-day Turkey. The Bible also teaches that China moves against Israel, Revelation 16.12. Presently, the Chinese are completing construction of a highway through Manchuria, Mongolia, Nepal, Tibet, West Pakistan, and Afghanistan. The road leads to the Euphrates River and Israel, and soon both communist superpowers, Russia and China, will head for the Holy Land when they do. God help us. Some believe they will act independently, while others say they'll be united. The point is that both armies are there for the bloodiest battle of the ages. The real shocker is that all the nations mentioned today, with the exception of Turkey, are already aligned according to the end time prophecies. Certainly the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. Thirdly, the Babylonian prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and John in the book of Revelation may picture the USA. However, as already observed, they're not necessary to prove that America is involved and on a collision course. Since we are unable to deal with the Babylonian mysteries extensively, I suggest that you get our booklet entitled American Prophecy. Now, let's consider one of the predictions briefly. The prophet Jeremiah in chapters 50 and 51 presents a clear-cut picture of this destructive war. The gruesome truths portrayed are not the ramblings of a senile prophet 
but the very words of and warnings from Jehovah God. God tells the prophet, I have put my words in thy mouth, Jeremiah 1, 9. So, in chapter 50, verse 9, an assembly of great nations or superpowers come up against Babylon from the north country, and Russia's north of the USA as well as Israel. The advancing enemy's arrows are shot with reliable accuracy. This could picture an onslaught of missiles which Russia has perfected. The sneak attack which catches Babylon unaware, verse 24, cuts asunder and breaks the nation described as the hammer of the earth, verse 23. Now this sneak attack is devastating because the archers or missile loaders are called together against Babylon to knock her from her haughty pedestal and punish her for turning from the Lord. Verse 29. All this takes place through a nuclear holocaust, for God continues to say, And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise them up, and I will kindle a fire, atomic warfare, in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Verse 32. Then is God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighboring cities thereof. So shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Verse 40. The reason? Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation. They, the Russians, shall hold the bow and lance, and they will be cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, verses 41 and 2. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved, and the cry is heard among the nations, verse 46. Chapter 51 continues. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain. Verse 8. One of the reasons for this nation's fall lies in the fact that draft dodgers have resisted the call to serve. Yes, the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They remain in their holds. Their might hath failed. They became as women. Verse 30. Another reason lies in the fact that terroristic saboteurs cause internal havoc in the nation. Verse 32 declares the passages are stopped and the men of war or military leaders are affrighted, scared to death. Passages may mean communications lines, and stopped is self-explanatory. The traitorous Judas seize the lines of communication and stop all television, telegraph, and telephone releases. Radio 2 is cut off. New York City's past power failures give one a descriptive picture of what follows in the wake of sabotage. America is ripe for such terrorism. William P. Hoare, contributing editor for the Review of the News, informs America that Capitol Hill is loaded with Soviet KGB agents. Their manpower has increased by 400% in recent months. And they go as far as monitoring White House communications with electronic devices located on the roof of the Soviet Embassy in Washington. The Soviet Embassy doubles as a KGB headquarters from which the Reds operate on Capitol Hill. God, give our leaders some brains and brawn, brains to see it and brawn to destroy it. The FBI director pleads with Americans to exercise patriotism and give America support and cooperation in reporting and stopping such saboteurs within our shores. Despite all that patriots try to do, it appears that a hopeless situation confronts America. Judgment comes upon all nations, Jeremiah 30, verse 11. Though she builds a spectacular space program and mounts up to heaven, and though she fortifies the height of her strength by creating utterly fantastic atomic-laden space vehicles. Verse 53. Still the broad walls of Babylon are utterly broken, and her high gates burned, atomic warfare, with fire. Verse 58. Oh, I shudder to think of what may happen. It's all so near. Are you ready? Prepare now. How you ask? by receiving Jesus Christ. When you know him, you'll be ready for the future. Listen to me in this closing moment. The only way to be saved is by asking Jesus Christ into your heart and life. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, we have not presented a truth that tickled ears today. Some have become frightened and alarmed. But God, we see it in every hand. The newspapers continually warn us of what's ahead. We ignore it. God help us not to ignore it, but to prepare in the light of it. Now pray this, Lord, I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior today and prepare myself for your return. In your name I pray. Amen. 
In today's discussion, I want to ask and answer some startling questions such as, what in the spirit world is happening? Who's the sinister personage behind this international weirdoism? Are there actually churches worshiping this malignant being called Satan? Are immoral sex acts performed during the ritual of their services? Is human blood offered in their ceremonies? Are fingers severed to please the satanic god of this world? And is rock music used to recruit converts? What's happening and why? Let's see for ourselves. First, we consider Satan's church. In San Francisco, the home of the first church of Satan, a bearded sorcerer in a suit made to resemble the devil, stands before an altar adorned with a naked woman. Everyone can guess what follows. This edifice to demonic powers claims 8,000 members. Billy Zioli of Gospel Films in Muskegon, Michigan, considered making a movie about these satanic forces and discovered that 4,000 of the 8,000 devil worshipers left evangelical Bible-believing churches to join the Temple of Satan. Wow! Now, what does all this signify? I believe it tells us that the return of Jesus Christ is at the door. Proof? A portrait of the last days is painted in 1 Timothy 4.1, which states, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, once this departure begins, and it has, it leads to the tribulation hour, a period of time which is entirely given over to devil worship. In fact, this is one of the reasons that God Almighty sends 21 judgments upon the earth. Confirmation, Revelation 9.20. They repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils. Furthermore, not only is the church of Satan a fulfillment of this prophecy, but numerous religions that deny the doctrine of Christ have as their leaders humans who are controlled by these spirits. Watch out for any religious group which denies the virgin birth of Christ, his deity that is God, his blood atonement, or his bodily resurrection. Beware of individual preachers with in mainline denominations who scoff these truths and declare the Bible to be a book of myths. Let me tell you something. These men have become controlled by wicked spirits. That's why 1 John 4 verses 1 to 3 warn, Beloved, believe not every spirit, teacher or preacher, but try the spirits, whether they're of God. Every spirit or teacher that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every teacher that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Hear it. This is that spirit of Antichrist. One either has the spirit of Christ or he has the spirit of Antichrist. Watch out for demons in the pulpit who make light of the cross and the shed blood of Jesus. Why? Because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. 1 Corinthians 118. Secondly, let's consider Satan's miracles. Beware of some modern-day healers. Miracles can also be duplicated by demons. I say this in love to warn people. The Bible says, try or test the spirits. Listen to the following reports. Casilda de Paula Barbosa, whose fame has spread throughout Brazil, has amazingly cured the sick of diseases ranging from ulcers to paralysis. Dr. Albanese said, one of my paralyzed patients walked again after seeing Casilda. Scores have been healed by her. Dwa Dinez, cured of cancer, said, they brought me on a stretcher and I walked away cured. Medical doctors confirmed these reports. Listen, Christian, please get this next bit of information. Casilda says, my power comes from a healing spirit named Roshina, who loves to drink liquor. When Roshina takes over my body, I know nothing. I suck the illness from the afflicted area, and the people are healed. Hey, this is a demonic spirit using a woman. Try the spirits. Again, Gordon Turner of the Greater London Healing Campaigns conducts as many as 32 spiritistic crusades in London, England annually. The greatest healing meetings in Europe are under his ministry. He's a spiritist, not a Christian. Spiritists reject the deity of Christ and believe in communicating with the dead. Thus we see that scores of false, heretical religions have great healing meetings. The miracles are real, but are the result of demonic powers which are counterfeiting the power of God in order to deceive people. Certainly the scene is being set for the master deceiver who is called the Antichrist. In fact, he will come to power with the aid of a miracle worker called 
the false prophet. Revelation 13 verses 13 to 15 state, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, or Antichrist, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life. What a miracle! Power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak. Wow! This false prophet sets up his tent during the tribulation hour and uses demonic means to turn men toward the Antichrist. So be careful of that polished gentleman who appears on television and claims to have miracle powers as you lay your hand on the set and that he can heal the blind, the lame, and the sick. He may have that power, but where did he get it? There are two sources. Try the spirits. God's commanding that. One healer claims that God has given him the power to fill teeth. <laughs> Come on, God Almighty can do better than that. If our great God did it, I'm sure he would give the fellow new teeth. God's not a pawn shop dealer. He's the creator of heaven and earth. Surely he can replace the entire tooth when he does the filling. Beware. Beware. Next, let's look in on some of Satan's worship services. I quote from Mike Warnke's book, The Satan Seller. Mr. Warnke was the high priest of Satan in San Bernardino, California, and had over 1,500 members in his devil's assembly. Included were salesmen, carpenters, teachers, students, college professors, housewives, clerks, businessmen, truck drivers, and even ministers and priests. Yeah. He describes a black mass in the following manner. A circle of people nine feet in diameter are seated on the floor. In the center of the circle is the altar, a granite slab supported on two sawhorses. On the slab, a girl lays on her back, nude and waiting. An inverted cross, an image of a goat's head, stand at each end of the altar. The rituals are reversed and profane. The sacraments are desecrated. Blasphemies take the place of prayers, and words attributed to Satan are read from the book, The Great Mother, which is held open on the stomach of the naked girl. A man comes forward and slips his finger into the confining pattern of nails and closes his eyes. An axe is lifted and brought down with force. His little finger down to the second knuckle remains on the board. He's immediately taken to a doctor. Then they take the blood sacrifice to Satan and mix it for communion. Now get this, young people. How do they proselytize or obtain converts? Warren Key adds, we initiate the young into satanic worship through rock music as a prelude to our rituals and encourage heavy usage of drugs to get them with it. Yes, rock plays a great part in our demonic services. Oh, isn't it sad that the same music plays a part in so many of our Christian services across the land? Let's quit imitating Satan's church if we're real Christians. Let's believe the Bible and practice it. Yay, let's sing a new song unto him, Psalm 33, 3. Why? Because he's put a new song in our mouths. Praise to our God, Psalm 40, verse 3. So let's speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19. Finally, let's discuss deliverance. How can one be liberated from oppressive bondage? The answer is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. So listen carefully if you're seeking help, for freedom can be yours immediately. How? When one receives Christ, God himself enters the person's heart and mind, and one becomes a partaker of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. So when Christ is in you, Colossians 1.27, he battles to produce victory for you. There is no doubt that you'll win, for greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 1 John 4, 4. So let the Savior into your life today. For he who cast out spirits with his words, Matthew 8, 16, and suffered not the demons to speak, Mark 1, 34, and went to the synagogues throughout all Galilee, casting out demons, Mark 1, 39, and gave his disciples authority over unclean spirits, Mark 6, 7, can certainly meet your every need today. I implore you, let Jesus be your Savior and deliver now as we pray. Repeat these words after me from your heart. If you're sincere, God will do something. Father, I know I'm a sinner. 
all have sinned. I believe, Lord, that I've been influenced by spirits, for they work in and against all of us. And now, Lord, I want to be set free. My heartaches have been many, but Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me now. I trust in what you did for me at Calvary's cross. Come into my heart. Save me for time and for eternity. I pray it in your name. Amen. The New Testament presents many shocking signs concerning events on earth at the time of Christ's return. Let's consider 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, which state, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. First, God says that in the last days, mankind will be self-centered. Such a description certainly pictures today's society. Even church members are so busy satisfying their flesh with the world's goodies and pleasures that they have no time to help others economically or spiritually. God help us. A certain scribe came to Jesus in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, and asked, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Presently, we in the professing church of Jesus Christ are so busy satisfying our bodily appetites that we have no time to help others or to win souls. Truly, we are lovers of our own selves. Now, one might expect this in the ungodly world of pagans, but how sad when one finds it among those who are supposedly the family of God. Our text also states that the love of money or covetousness will manifest itself in the last days. During the first century, the apostle Peter could say in Acts 3, 6, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Today the church has wealth and told, but it does not have the power to perform miracles. We're living in the Laodicean age. God says in Revelation 3:15, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Verse 17. So many in our churches today are in the upper crust. They have money and really think they're something. Beware, 1 Timothy 6.10 tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after grasped, grasped for, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How sad it is in our day to pick up Christian periodicals and read, do you want to make 40000 to 50000 a year? As if this were the believer's goal. Thank God when he blesses Christians and they use their gain for his glory. But oh, how many there are today who build an empire on earth while neglecting the work of Jesus Christ. The third sign mentioned is pride. God said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up, James 4.10. Satan fell because of pride. In Isaiah 14.13, he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. He had eye trouble. He should have seen a good optometrist. <laughs> Often, professing believers are likewise proud. A man recently came to me with tears in his eyes and said, I was trying to win this young lady to Christ. Her parents are alcoholics. She had nothing to wear but an old tattered dress. I took her to our church, and when she walked down the aisle, I heard a snooty person behind me say, Why do they bring that kind of trash to our church? Such hypocrites, high and mighty, how one of the signs that Jesus Christ 
is coming soon. Oh, let's follow the Savior who said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why, Jesus, I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest on your souls. The fourth sign mentioned is blasphemy. This is a sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 and 13, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. What's so great about that, Paul? Who was before a blasphemer. What did Paul do? He murdered Christians and hated the name of Jesus. There are many like him today. Our seminaries are filled with apostates who mock the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his deity, his blood atonement, and his bodily resurrection. They talk of higher criticism and blaspheme the Christ of the Scriptures. Seventy percent of our ministers are either affected or infected by this malady. God help us. Our blessed Redeemer must be coming soon. The Bible also states that as the end of this age draws near, children will manifest an attitude of disobedience toward their parents. Today many young people say that they love Jesus Christ, yet when mom or dad ask them to do something, they reply with a smart remark. Listen, young man, young lady, to Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. This is from God. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. I was greatly moved not long ago as I studied John 19, verses 26 and 27. Has the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross, dying for your sins and mine? He looked down and saw his wonderful mother, Mary, and John, the disciple whom he loved, standing near. He said, Woman, behold thy son, and to John, behold thy mother. Take care of her when I'm gone. Even in the last moments of life, our Lord remembered his mother. Oh, how we ought to be like him, how we ought to obey him when he said, Honor your mother and father. Next we find that the end-time residents of planet Earth are unthankful. Again, this sign includes professing Christians. Look at some of our church members. They're ashamed to pray in a restaurant. When they do bow their head, they sit there and scratch their eyebrows <laughs> so that no one suspects they're talking to Almighty God. What a sad testimony to the one who gave us all that they might have abundant life. The seventh sign presented tells us that men will be unholy. What a picture of 20th century Christianity. Godly separation from the world, according to the Bible, is sneered at as bigotry and puritanism. When one preaches against dirty, lewd movies, the filthiness of rock, and the soul-damning habits of drug abuse and alcoholism, many church members say, let's not talk about secondary issues. My friend, the holiness of God and holy living are not secondary issues. First Thessalonians 4, 7 states, God hath called us not unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. First Peter 1, 16, be you holy, for I'm holy. Again, I say that this sign indicates the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Via sign number eight, we also find that mankind will be without natural affection. This refers to the dissolution of the family through a lack of love. Look at the current divorce rate, the murder of babies through abortion, and the increasing child abuse reports. And you'll see that this sign is presently being fulfilled. God adds the truce breakers, liars, despisers of the righteous, traitors, the heady and the high-minded, or literally society snobs, as well as adults who throw temper tantrums, will all be present in record numbers at the time of Christ's return. In the few moments remaining, however, let's deal with two final signs. God states that mankind will also be incontinent or unable to control lust in the last days. Does this not picture present-day swingers, one-night flingers, adulterers, fornicators, and homosexuals? Their cry is, live it up! But our God says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled in marriage. But outside of marriage, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge, Hebrews 13, 4. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 warn, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, all having to do with sexual promiscuity, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Finally, in the last days, even among professing Christians, men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. More and more churches will go into the entertainment business in order to draw crowds. People must be amused, and the church must meet the cravings of pleasure-mad members. 
How else will hypocrites be held together? How else will half-hearted members be attracted to the services where the latest Christian movie or the Christian minstrel show is already replacing the Word of God? Beloved, God has called us to run a lifeboat, not a showboat. We need to get souls into the kingdom of God. Many of our religious crusades even feature pagan movie stars whose lives are a mockery to God. Yet they're presented because entertainers draw crowds. No matter that these individuals are still working full-time in nightclubs where drinking, gambling, filthy jokes, and solicitations for sex are prevalent. It doesn't matter because the end justifies the means. If these religious professors draw crowds, it's the right thing to do. God forgive us. Through it all, Christless souls are lulled to sleep and made to feel religious while every carnal desire of the flesh is gratified under the sanction of the church. God's way of reaching souls in the last days is described in Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Study the 19 signs of 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, and you'll come to but one conclusion. Soon the trumpet of God will sound, and we shall hear three words. Come up hither, Revelation 4.1. Then we'll sweep through the heavenlies to meet Jesus. Are you ready for this glorious event? Are you saved? Will you let Jesus in your heart right now? And be ready? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask that for that one who has never known Christ, that as they see the signs of the times being fulfilled, realize that soon the Christian will go home to meet Jesus, that they'll prepare. Pray this prayer after me. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you that you shed your blood for the remission of my sins. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. In your name, I pray it. If you'll do that and mean it. If you've done it, admit it. God just saved you.